What evidence is there? Has anyone done a scientific study in which they have a control group and a group of graduates and they determine, are they more successful in their careers? Do they earn more money? Are their grades higher if they are students? Do they have a lower divorce rate? Are they less likely to need medication for depression or anxiety? What proof do we have, objective proof, measurable proof, that these seminars actually improve people? All they really offer us are surveys in which they ask uh, participants, what do you feel you, you accomplished? How do you feel about this seminar now that you've completed? And of course, they are often euphoric. But objectively, if they actually did improve people's lives, we could see it and measure it. This week on the podcast, we're airing a special four-part series on the cult of personal development. So many of us pick up books and go to seminars in the hopes of improving our lives. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be when we're not aware of how it can actually lead to a lot of bad things when we let charismatic leaders take advantage of us and manipulate us. So we decided to bring in former cult members to dissect this process and explain how this actually happens so that you can avoid it. I'm really excited about something totally new called an airspace that gives you an opportunity to participate in the show and ask your questions. All you have to do is submit a question and either a guest or I reply, you'll get an email letting you know. And all you have to do is go to unmistakablecreative.com slash participate. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash participate. Rick, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Well, it's a pleasure to join you. Yeah. So I actually found out about your work uh, when I, for some strange reason, started to really kind of dig into cult psychology. And, you know, the more that I started to dig in, I kept seeing these trends, not just in, you know, things that are categorized as cults, but even in personal development, which so many of the people who listen to our show, uh, myself included, participate in. Um, but before we get into all of that, uh, I want to start asking you, what did your parents do for work and how did that end up shaping and influencing the choices that you ended up making in your own life and career? Well, my dad was a plumber and, uh, he owned a small plumbing company. He worked very hard and, uh, my mother was a, a basically a, um, secretarial person. She worked for the Jewish community center in Phoenix, Arizona for, she was over 30 years. So it, that had a, quite an effect uh, on me. I grew up in a, in a pretty tight knit Jewish community in Phoenix, uh, in, in the fifties, sixties, seventies. And it was, uh, you know, everything was kind of based around the Jewish community center, uh, the pool in the summer, uh, the camp activities. I was a counselor for the camp. Uh, and my father would, uh, take me with him on jobs and I'd watch him do plumbing work. And he always told me, Rick, I hope you won't be a plumber. It's awfully hard work. He, he didn't hope for me to be a plumber and follow in his footsteps. Yeah. So from what I understand, just from having had former Jewish people here as guests on the podcast, the narrative, uh, around careers and most typical Jewish families is kind of similar to the narrative of Indian families, doctor, lawyer, engineer, future career choices. This is what we recommend. This is what you should do. Uh, what, what did your parents teach you about making your way in the world? Well, I think my dad wanted me to, um, to, you know, basically be white collar And um, my mother, I think, uh, hoped maybe I would be an attorney. She always told me, I thought you should have been a lawyer. And, uh, and, And I guess I just had a very unusual process in, in my career, in my uh, work, because I ended up working for my cousin in the wrecking yard business. He had a salvage company, a big one in Phoenix. And I worked for him and I would, uh, buy and sell salvage and rebuild cars. And that really was what I was intensely interested in for a long time. And my dad was really happy that I was working with my cousin. He was very successful. And my dad felt that would really be good for me financially. And then I got sidetracked into dealing with uh, uh, very unusual fringe religious groups and cults. 
And that started very serendipitously when my grandmother, who lived in a Jewish nursing home in Phoenix, was accosted by a nurse's aide that worked at the nursing home. And I found out that that person had been planted there by this weird uh, organization that targeted Jewish people and the elderly uh, for recruitment. And that began my volunteer work, which led to my intervention work, uh, which just kept rolling. And that started in 1982. And here I am many years later. Uh, yeah. And that was, uh, you know, that was the, the turning point where I went into the current work that I'm in. Mm. You, you mentioned growing up in a community that it sounds like was very tight knit and, uh, you know, it, I think that, that this is one thing that's interesting is that to me, many of the things that draw people to personal development, one of them is the sense of community that it brings. You know, it's often what draws people to religion. Uh, even as an Indian person, I can tell you, my parents' closest friends are people that they have met at the temple. But you've had a front row seat to what happens when communities go off the rails. But before we get to that aspect of it, uh, what are the what are the things that you saw growing up, you know, in community, both good and bad? that you think influenced what you ended up doing later and also shaped your perspective on all of this? Well, I think that I felt pretty good about my community. Phoenix was a small city. My family moved there in, in 1956 from Cleveland, Ohio. And it was, um, it was an adventure, I guess, for my dad and my mom to leave the Midwest and end up out in the Southwest. And I grew up in uh, the Jewish community was maybe about 50, 70,000. It's way larger than that now. And of course, Phoenix is now the sixth largest city in the United States. At that time, it was an overgrown town. And the Jewish community was very tight knit around the Phoenix Jewish Community Center and around my family's temple, which was Temple Beth Israel, the oldest uh, congregation in Phoenix. And um, we had the same rabbi for many years, uh, Rabbi Albert Plotkin. And he bar mitzvahed me. He married my sister, bar mitzvahed my brother, and uh, buried my father. So wow. he, he was really there as I went through all the life cycles. And he was, he was kind of a mentor, a friend, a very nice man. And then, of course, growing up around the Jewish Community Center, I would go there for summer camp. And uh, during that time, uh, I really got to know all the other Jewish families that that irradiated around the center. And it was we all knew each other and it was a very strong sense of community. And uh, then I became a, a camp counselor, uh, went through counselor and training, uh, assistant counselor, senior counselor. And then I also uh, worked at a uh, camp in the mountains where there were cabins and, uh, and people went to live there during the summer uh, at camp. And I did one summer up there. So it was, uh, it was very, I think it was a, a very good experience from the standpoint of building a strong sense of community and identity. And mm -hmm. uh, my mother was very well respected in the Jewish community because she had worked so long for the center. And my dad was everybody's Jewish plumber. <laughs> I mean, everybody liked my dad because he was he was a good, honest plumber, hardworking, and the Jewish families really enjoyed having a Jewish plumber. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like nothing but good came from this. I mean, your dad encouraged you, it sounds like, early on to pursue success. And I, I wonder, did you, before getting into you know, the cult intervention work that you did, was personal development ever part of your life? Like, did you read self-help books, go to seminars or do any of this stuff? No, that wasn't my thing. Uh, yeah. Probably the closest thing I ever came to it is I read that book. You probably know it. What is it called? Uh, cyber something. I'm, I'm mm. trying to remember. I, 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 I read a, a book that was a kind of a self-help book, uh, but I, it just didn't interest me that much. Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell that Maltz. Was, that was it. That was it. Okay. So I, I think that part of why I wanted to talk to you is that you seem to have, you know, even before delving into this material, uh, an inherent skepticism about what's packed into it. And I think that, you know, the thing that 
has happened to me, I think, as I've done this show, you know, after a thousand interviews and reading enough self-help books to start a side hustle as a therapist is to become much more aware of both context and to be skeptical about the information that I am being told. Um, but I think that the thing is that most people, I don't think, go into any of this with the intention of joining cults. It doesn't sound you know, to me like that. I mean, that was never my intention. And all, we can talk specifically about a, something, an organization that I felt was basically had all the characteristics of a cult, which you mentioned uh, in your book, which we'll get into. But I think that that's where I want to start is, you know, what is it that draws people to organizations like this in the first place? And then how do they get so far down this rabbit hole that it takes somebody like you to come along and say, hey, we need to pull you out of this nightmare? Well, I think you have to realize that these uh, groups called cults and and these cult leaders are very predatory and they're incredibly deceptive. So what they present to the public and what they use to entice people in is basically a bait and switch con. They tell you that you're going to get this, but you really get that. And it's not anything like what you thought it would be. So there is uh, just in, incredible deception. And I think if people understood what was behind the door, you know, what was being deliberately concealed from them uh, in an effort to entrap them, they would never even become involved in many of these groups. Uh, I yeah. think that, uh, that what I do when I do an intervention to help someone get out of a, a destructive authoritarian group is I really kind of rewind their whole experience and we talk about, well, how did you get in and what did they initially tell you? And what they then begin to realize as we go through the intervention, if they agree to stay, is that they had no idea what they were really getting involved in, that what they initially thought uh, was the meaning of the group, the purpose of the group was not really what they experienced as, as they became immersed and and these groups, you know, as you're becoming immersed, you're being pulled into this kind of bubble where they control the environment, they control the social environment. You become isolated. Uh, you you often become cut off from old friends and family, and you rely on the people around you who are now all in this organization or group to reflect what is reality, what is the truth. Uh, where am I? And uh, they don't give you accurate feedback. They're, they're true believers. Uh, they may be well-intentioned, but what they're really doing is just reinforcing the group mindset and repeating the group jargon. And you're not really getting a kind of sense of what you're really involved in. And you just become submerged in it. And basically what they do is they shut down critical thinking. They shut mm -hmm. down your ability to, to analyze what's happening. They make you feel really ashamed to doubt the group, to be analytical about what you're being presented with. And, and you just stop thinking and you accept what the group tells you. And you become really dependent upon the group to make value judgments for you and and to determine what is good, what is bad. And and you you're in you're behind the looking glass. You're in a destructive cult. And that's not where you thought. Can you hear purple? Listen to turquoise. What's the sound of a rainbow? Let's get real. Trying to sell TVs with audio is pretty dumb. So listen to me, Joel McHale. All we want is great-looking TVs with our favorite features, like the quality of Dolby Vision IQ, the smarts of Android TV, and the vibrancy of Quantum.Color. TVs like the Hisense ULED series. Visit Hisense.com and see for yourself. Hisense. Let's get real. Look, staying healthy isn't easy. Watching your diet, hitting the gym, avoiding stress. But a good night's rest helps boost your overall health and wellness. And it couldn't be easier. The new Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed is the only bed that effortlessly adjusts and responds to both of you. The result? You wake up ready for anything. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Don't miss our weekend special. Save up to $1,000 on the Sleep Number 360 i10 Smart Bed and adjustable base. Ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. 
This episode of The Unmistakable Creative is brought to you by ThoughtWorks, a global technology consultancy that's hiring senior and lead developers, data engineers, infrastructure consultants, and more to join them in their roles across the United States. It's pretty clear that last year changed our working lives forever, and maybe it made you realize that you were ready for a change. At ThoughtWorks, they challenge curious minds to make a real impact, get to know them, and discover how you can make your mark in tech. At ThoughtWorks, you're free to seek the most ambitious challenges, free to change career paths, free to use technology as a tool for social change, and free to be yourself. They're looking for change makers, opportunity creators, status quo shakers, thought workers. And if you're listening to The Unmistakable Creative, that's probably you. Learn more and apply at ThoughtWorks.com slash careers. Again, that's ThoughtWorks.com slash careers. You were going. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, so often I think that when people hear the word cult in their mind, their association are, are things like the Church of Scientology or, you know, some of these murderous cults that you read, you read about in the book. I don't think that most people think, oh, going to a Tony Robbins seminar is a step into joining a cult. But when you look at how all of this happens, you know, we just have Stephen Kotler here. And he said, you know, what is happening in most of these self-help seminars is, to your point, they're putting you in an environment in which you're basically shutting off rational thinking and meaning is being made for you. And people are putting you into these deep flow states where rational thinking is shut off. But the thing is that Nobody would characterize Tony Robbins with the same sort of, you know, characteristics as Keith Raniere. Yet a lot of the same dynamics are in play in those environments. Um, so why is it that, that we overlook that? I mean, and what do you want people to know who are, you know, with good intentions going in and, you know, signing up to study with coaches, going to workshops? Uh, you know, I mean, these are things like all of us, my listeners and myself included, have probably done. Well, can the leader be wrong? Uh, is the leader questioned? What kind of accountability does the leader have? And when you look at a destructive cult or a destructive authoritarian group, the most salient single feature is this all-powerful leader that becomes an object of worship. And and that that individual is the defining element and driving force of the group. So it becomes basically a personality cult. And then second, that that leader, that group is using coercive persuasion to break people down, change them, and then lock them into a certain mindset. And then finally, they hurt people. I mean, they exploit people financially. They, they may exploit people uh, sexually. There may be physical abuse in a group. Uh, they may make money from free labor. Now, that that varies from group to group. Not all groups that are called destructive cults or, or destructive authoritarian groups are equally destructive. There are some that are way worse than others. For example, mm -hmm. Nexium, where Keith Raniere, over a period of years, and I knew him for many years, uh, he became worse and worse as time went on. Uh, yeah. He became, in a sense, a victim of his own hype. He was encapsulated, cocooned in this Nexium subculture in Albany, New York. And he had all these people that were just literally bowing down to him and uh, subordinating themselves to him entirely. And then he collected increasingly uh, women who would wait on him and, and serve his every need. And his demands just kept escalating until he literally tortured women by branding them. Uh, physically. And there was a doctor, a woman that actually did the branding. And mm. uh, there were, I think, more than 100 women that were branded with Keith and Ranieri's initials before he was arrested. Now, he basically designed what I would call a self-help seminar selling company, which was originally called Executive Success Programs, but then later was called Nexium. And basically, they would sell you on a seminar that could last uh, a weekend or maybe even 13 or 14 or 16 days. And during that time, you would be subjected to coaching and a constantly controlled environment enveloped by Nexium devotees. And you would be watching videos. Uh, you would be cross-examined in what they called the exploration of meaning questions. And what it was all about was just breaking people down, getting them to confess all their vulnerabilities, uh, their problems, and then using that to leverage them and then control them. 
And that's what Ranieri did. And basically what these seminar selling uh, companies do is they create an environment to sell the leader's philosophy. In Keith Ranieri's uh, group, it was called Rational Inquiry. And it was really just copied from Scientology, Ayn Rand, Amway. He had once been an Amway salesman. And it, it wasn't really original other than the way it was concocted together. But the bottom line was that the seminar was a means to download this philosophy into the minds of each uh, person that would attend, each participant. And so when you look at a Tony Robbins seminar or you look at a Landmark Education uh, Forum, or yeah. any number of other groups that do this, I call it large group awareness training or an LGAT. And I devoted a chapter in my book mm -hmm. to LGATs discussing not only Ranieri, but Landmark and many other groups. Uh, and what they all share in common is they have this uh, unmistakable personality that, you know, is at the head of the room who is directing the seminar and who is basically telling you, my philosophy, my worldview is a panacea. And if you embrace it, it will change your life. It will change you to be a better person, to uh, be more successful at work, to be more successful in your marriage and at home, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's, it's basically not a technology, but rather selling you on a philosophy and claiming that it is the one ingredient that can change everything in your life. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that this is one of the reasons when I have podcast guests, I am very intentional about asking them to back up everything they're saying with research. Uh, because you just so often I feel like most of it is pseudoscience that is promoted as real science. And so one, one, you know, why does that happen? Uh, and, and to your point, I think that people who join these things join them with good intentions. So I wonder, this is, I mean, if you know Keith Ranieri, what I wonder, just because, you know, when you see a commercial for the Church of Scientology, for anybody who has studied self-improvement, the first time you see that commercial, until they see that you see the words on, you know, the screen that say Church of Scientology, you're like, yeah, that sounds great. Like, I find myself nodding until I see the word Scientology. Um, so I wonder, do you think that somebody like Keith Ranieri, their intentions just go off the rails? Uh, or do they start out thinking this way with this just, you know, uh, malicious intention from the start? Well, in Ranieri's case, yes. I mean, I think that he was uh, a con man. He was a grifter. He never really had a real job in his entire life. I mean, he just basically used and abused people to make a buck. And uh, he was a terrible, terrible, obnoxious person, uh, though he would he would try to uh, pass himself off as a, a kind of intellectual philosopher king who was really kind of quiet and humble. But that wasn't really who he was. I spent hours with him in uh, court ordered mediation. Uh, any of your listeners can go to culteducation.com. And that's the Cult Education Institute database. And you'll find the largest collection of archival historical material about Nexium that's available online. And it goes all the way back to when Keith Ranieri was a, a multi-level marketing uh, salesman. And he created, after he was an Amway a distributor, he created something called Consumer Byline that was also multi-level marketing until it was sued out of existence by multiple attorney generals of various states who said it was a pyramid scheme. And so when I uh, became aware of Ranieri, I started to archive material online. Uh, and, and the way I became aware of him was a family retained me to do interventions to get their, uh, their, their, their daughter, two daughters and a son out of Nexium. Uh, I was successful in two of the interventions, not successful in one. And then I found all this material about Ranieri. I built my file about him before the intervention. And I decided to put that material online so that people would know about his background. 
And in particular, there were two doctors, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, who wrote uh, papers analyzing the training. And after I put that online, uh, Forbes magazine did a cover story about Keith Raniere as the most bizarre, weird uh, executive coach in existence. And he then sued me, trying to get me to take down the, the critical information about him so that no one could see it. And uh, he continued to sue me for 14 years. In fact, he spent about $5 million suing me. And he was funded by two heiresses to the Seagram's liquor fortune, Claire and Sarah Bronfman. Claire Bronfman is now in prison, uh, serving a sentence for her involvement in Nexium. And Keith Ranieri, uh, who some of your listeners might not know, was sentenced to 120 years in prison for sex trafficking, uh, tax fraud, uh, you know, racketeering. I mean, he, he really was uh, completely... Uh, put away. And so I dealt with him for a long, long time. And there would be court ordered mediations. I would sit through his depositions. And what I saw was a psychopath, someone who had no little, if any, sympathy for anyone, incapable of empathy, and just a vicious person who preyed on others and exploited them. And I'm, I'm afraid to say there are a lot of people like that out there that are running groups called cults. Hmm. So, you know, there's something you say in the book, uh, you know, about the three characteristic criteria of, of cults, you know, a charismatic leader who increasingly becomes an object of worship as the general principles that may have originally sustained the group lose their power, a process I call persuasion or thought reform, economic, sexual, and other exploitation of group members by the leader and the ruling coterie. Uh, you know, and, and that really struck me because when I looked back at almost every personal development seminar that I've ever been in, Landmark being one of them, I couldn't help but notice that, wait a minute, all these people who led these seminars had these characteristics in common, um, in most cases, economic exploitation. Uh, but you may be the one person who can kind of shed some light on the question that I've probably asked damn near every single person I've interviewed, uh, which is, you know, the sort of vicious cycle of personal development that people tend to get stuck in, where you know, they go from seminar to seminar to seminar and nothing changes. You know, so you get this group of people who end up having these astounding results. They become the people who you put on a sales page for the testimonials. They're the ones who basically talk about how this whole thing has changed their life. And the one thing that I realized is left out of almost every one of these situations is context. Like, you know, you don't consider the fact that, wait a minute, this person has a background uh, that might be different than yours. They may have come from, you know, different economic circumstances, whatever it is. Uh, but you know, why is it that people get trapped into this, this vicious cycle? I mean, I did the landmark forum and I remember thinking, I was like, the information here is great. And anytime a friend asked me, I said, do the advanced course of the forum and then get the hell out of there. Don't go anywhere near it again. Well, because, you know, it's designed to hook you. I mean, when Werner Erhard, whose given name is Jack Rosenberg, created uh, EST, Erhard Seminars Training, which became Landmark, which presents the forum and various courses. And by the way, they're they're selling more seminars now than I think they ever have. Uh, last time I checked, they were they were billing more than seventy five million dollars a year, and so they're not only across the U.S. in major cities, but they're in Asia as well, and they've spread all. They've become global, and yeah. Earhart is a very wealthy man, past eighty now, and uh, not not as intimately involved in the business as he once was, but still definitely involved. And his brother and his uh, old lawyer, Art Schreiber, his sister, uh, pretty much run Landmark. And and I think basically what you end up being is kind of a seminar junkie. I mean, they they hook you on it. They make you feel that this is the way to have meaning in your life. This is the way to become your authentic self. And that if you resist, you're uncoachable, you're not working with them. But it is a philosophy that Werner Erhard is downloading through these seminars. And it's a combination of a bit of Scientology and uh, a German philosopher by the name of Heidegger. And, and it's predicated on the principle that there are no victims and that you must take total responsibility for everything in your life. Imagine if you had been a child that was molested or or a rape victim. Should you take responsibility for that? 
You know, so there are people that are in the seminars that are being pushed to the limit that really kind of have meltdowns. And I've had people call me that had uh, a loved one that had a psychotic break or a breakdown of one sort or another as a result of the intense pressure uh, within these uh, with, within these seminars. And I write about this in my book and also James Arthur Ray, uh, who went to prison for, I think, two years. He had mm-hmm. a seminar series in which he created what he called a sweat lodge, and he would push people beyond the breaking point. And in one of his sweat lodge experiences in Sedona, Arizona, three people died and many people were hospitalized from dehydration. He literally baked them to death. And he ended up going to jail for a couple of years for negligent homicide. And now he's back out doing his thing again. And here, here is my bottom line about where, where, this, where science should take a, a seat, is that how do we know that these self-improvement courses are in fact effective? Yeah. What evidence is there? Has anyone done a scientific study in which they have a control group and a group of graduates, and they take them one year out, two year out, two two years out, three years out, and they they determine are they more successful in their careers? Do they earn more money? Are their grades higher if they are students? Do they have a lower divorce rate? Are they less likely to need uh, medication for depression or anxiety? Uh, what proof do we have, objective proof, measurable proof, that these seminars actually improve people? All, all they really offer us are surveys in which they ask uh, participants, what do you feel you, you accomplished? How do you feel about, about this seminar now that you've completed? And of course, they are often euphoric. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't argue that these seminars can persuade people that they have greatly benefited from the training. I mean, that seems to be how they're designed. But do they actually produce scientifically measurable results that are objective? And none of these seminars, despite the fact that they rake in millions of dollars a year, have funded that kind of research to prove the efficacy of their training. And I would say that because they're not doing that, uh, we have reason to suspect that they really don't produce much improvement at all. And that what they do produce is the subjective feeling that you are better, that everything is better. But objectively, if, if they actually did improve people's lives, we could see it and measure it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that makes a a perfect segue to uh, an experience I want to ask you about. So, Uh, One, are you familiar with the seduction community? Mm, A little bit, yeah. Okay. So the seduction community had damn near every characteristic of a cult that you wrote about in your book. And I can tell you, you know, just kind of how I got involved. It it was pretty much like most of the guys there. We were having trouble with our dating lives. And, you know, I I remember because I'm writing a new book and I said, you know, how do so many smart people make such ridiculous decisions and like male libido you know, intellect doesn't stand a chance against the male libido. And, you know, I saw over the course of probably five, six years that my life became nothing but a series of going to workshops, hanging out with other people in this community. And one thing in particular that really struck me that you actually wrote about uh, was this idea of, of codifying language. You know, you said, Many groups or subcultures have their own insider jargon, but Lifton, who is another person you referenced the book, draws distinctions between the verbiage and what he describes as totalist language, which is just repetitiously centered on all-encompassing jargon, prematurely abstract, highly categorical, and relentlessly judging. And, you know, I, I remember this is literally what would happen in the seduction community. They had terminology for everything that you know, was basically terminology that only existed in their community, but to the outside world, it was nonsense. And I I think that there were two friends and I that were in it together. And, you know, I gravitated towards them because they seemed like smart, normal people who didn't belong there were, you know, on the flip side of that, there were a lot of weirdos who often when you'd see them talk to somebody, you'd look and say, this guy seems like he's plotting plotting a murder, you know, more than he's plotting a seduction. Um, And it took us all a very long time to get out of it. And I think by the time all of us left, like friends of mine said that 
you know, their lives <laughs> improved measurably when they quit, like then their dating lives started to improve. But what I wonder is, you know, how so many, like a couple of smart people, and we're talking PhDs, people who've gone on to build, you know, really, really successful startups, uh, you know, people who worked at high profile technology companies, not a bunch of losers, but actually pretty solid guys. How does that even happen? Well, it happens by word of mouth. It happens from one friend ushering another friend into a seminar. I mean, frequently, the reason why people attend these uh, self-help seminars is because someone they know has introduced them to the course curriculum. And when they ask that person, well, what exactly goes on? They will say, well, you have to experience it. You have to go, I can't really tell you that would ruin it. Uh, there's one group in particular that is very similar to what you're discussing, which is called the Sterling Institute of Relationship. And it was started by a guy by the name of Justin Sterling, who uh, purportedly was an SD. He, he used to be involved in Earhart Seminars training, uh, you know, the Werner Earhart Seminars. And he created a composite of uh, John Gray's writings, Robert Bly's writings, you know, uh, women are from Venus, men are from Mars, you know, Robert Bly, Iron Man, or Iron Mike, or whatever. And uh, it was a philosophy, again, of, of life. And what Sterling would tell everyone is that if you embrace this philosophy, it will make for a successful marriage and a very uh, successful dating life, leading into a successful marriage. So, the, but here's the thing. Justin Sterling's been divorced twice, and his divorces were just intense. I know because I testified as an expert witness in his second divorce proceeding in California. I met his wife. Hardly an example of a successful marriage. Uh, his first marriage uh, ended in divorce, of, of course, and his uh, visitation with his daughter who was a minor child at the time, had to be supervised. So this was a guy who, a social worker evaluating him, felt she could not sign off on him visiting with his daughter alone. Wow. Like, likewise, Werner Erhard went through divorces, uh, unhappy family situations, and you wonder to yourself, if these gurus have the philosophy that is a cure-all, it's a panacea to make everything right, why did everything go so wrong in their, <laughs> in their lives? lives? Yeah. I mean, Werner Erhard is a poster poster boy, not for a successful personal life, but for a troubled personal life. And, and by the way, many of his uh, staff that worked for him when he was actively involved in running the forum and, and his seminars said that he was just unbearable and very, uh, you know, just a suffocating, controlling uh, unbearable boss uh, that, that that they said, uh, thought that he encouraged them to think of him as almost godly, and they worshipped him. So it was very close to a personality cult. And I think a lot of these people that are gurus uh, in the seminar self-help business, uh, they, they seem to be incapable of healing themselves and resolving their own issues. And yet they want to tell us that they have the answer to our problems, which I think is incredible. Can you hear purple? Listen to turquoise? What's the sound of a rainbow? Let's get real. Trying to sell TVs with audio is pretty dumb. So listen to me, Joel McHale. All we want is great looking TVs with our favorite features, like the quality of Dolby Vision IQ, the smarts of Android TV, and the vibrancy of quantum.color. TVs like the Hisense ULED series. Visit Hisense.com and see for yourself. Hisense, let's get real. It's funny you say that because I, you know, in, in preparation for our conversation and, and some of the other interviews I'm doing as part of the series, I, I went back and read Neil Strauss's book, The Game. And some of what I, I read, you know, suddenly shocked me. I said, wait a minute, we were te learning how to like get good with women from a bunch of guys who couldn't keep a relationship or let alone, you know, actually get a woman. Most of them are actually lying. 
it, you know, they presented these sort of larger than life images of themselves that people just bought into. Uh, but one thing I wonder is, you know, and I think this will make a perfect segue to start talking about the deprogramming part of this is that what is it that finally happens to people like me and my friends who say, oh, you know what? This is ridiculous. We've been involved with this for six years and we're all still single. What the hell are we doing? Like, why did it take that long for us to have a wake up call like that? Well, because the the seminar selling company doesn't want you to wake up and they're doing everything possible to make you feel that if things aren't working out, it's your problem. There's never anything wrong with their seminar training. It's always you aren't really absorbing the training properly or uncoachable. Uh, it's your problem. Same thing with multi-level marketing companies. If if you're if you're not making money, it's because you're a loser. It's not because their business plan is flawed. For example, market saturation. They have too many distributors in a given area, uh, which they never consider because they're just trying to get make as much money as they can from everybody. But the bottom line is they always blame you. They make you feel that you are responsible for whatever shortcomings there are. Uh, you are responsible if you don't get the results that they promise. So you blame yourself until maybe you wake up one day and you say, what the heck? I need to get out of here. It's not doing any good for me. Or you see something in the group that shocks you. Uh, for example, the behavior of one of the leaders of a seminar or the way in which a seminar goes sideways and no one is doing anything to, to make it safe and to help people. And so you end up walking away and many people walk away from cults and uh, they they feel that really it wasn't, they they really don't understand what happened to them. They tend to blame themselves. They say, gee, I was really stupid. I was a sucker. It's my fault. Or, or, or they don't really unpack their experience and begin to analyze piece by piece what happened to them. And so when, when I do interventions, when I'm hired by a family or a spouse and I sit down with someone, and uh, uh, I offer case vignettes in my book, for example, a landmark intervention with a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. I remember that very distinctly. Yeah. In fact, that I've, I've actually deprogrammed five medical doctors. Uh, wow. One was an orthopedic surgeon. One was an anesthesiologist. I mean, these were very sophisticated people who were caught up in schemes uh, by groups called cults. And they were manipulated. So what you do in an intervention is you help that individual unpack what has happened. You rewind it to the beginning of their experience with the group. And you look at the recruitment techniques that were used. Were they deceptive? Were they, uh, were they manipulative? Uh, and then you compare them to established criteria, such as um, the uh, thought reform criteria written by Robert J. Lifton, a psychiatrist who wrote the book Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. Or you can also look at influence techniques as defined by Robert Cialdini in his seminal book Influence. And the three steps to coercive persuasion, which are in Edgar Schein's book Coercive Persuasion. So basically, you look at those criteria, you look at all the tricks of the trade, and then you draw parallels between what is being written about in, in these books that examine the process of coercive persuasion and influence and what is going on in that particular group. And then also you look at what is a, a destructive authoritarian group. How would I recognize that? Well, there's going to be this leader that is charismatic that becomes an object of worship. The leader is going to use uh, intense indoctrination, uh, coercive persuasion to to gain undue influence over the members. And then finally, that leader is going to take advantage of having that kind of influence to, to get whatever he or she wants out of the members and exploit them. And so you, you look at that, and then you also have the family present during the intervention, and they will reflect on what they see as alarming uh, in the behavior of their loved one who's become involved in a particular group or following a particular leader. And, and ultimately, also, you want to examine that group. What 
has the group deliberately withheld from the individual in, in the process of of their recruitment and indoctrination? Have they lied? Have they deliberately kept certain things secret uh, and and not disclosed them? And shouldn't that person who's involved know all the facts about that particular group if they're going to make a fully informed decision about continuing with it? So you you go through that process with the individual that you're working with, or I do, and that may take two or three days of work with the family there. And then you hope that in that time, their critical thinking process is is heightened and enhanced, and they can then literally think their way out of the group. So I guess the the question that raises for me is, is what separates the person like, you know, me or, or my friends who finally just woke up and said, you know, to hell with this, we're done. We don't need to do this anymore. Uh, this is actually doing the opposite of, of making us attractive. We don't have anything else going on in our lives. So we're actually unattractive to women uh, versus the person whose family needs to hire you to come in and f- basically do an intervention. Well, be, be, in my case, like, let's take the doctor that um, I work with who is deeply involved in landmark education. Uh, it was affecting his practice. He was, he was trying to recruit other doctors. He was talking endlessly with his staff, and people were becoming alienated. His wife did not want to become involved with Landmark. She didn't want to even attend a graduation. After she did one graduation, she was done. And she didn't want to take any of the courses. And so it became a, a, a the, it created a rift between the couple in which he was constantly extolling Landmark and, and begging his wife to go to the forum. And she was saying, no, I don't want to. And then also his social life became populated by Landmark junkies. And uh, she didn't appreciate it. It was really breaking down their marriage and affecting his career. And so she retained me in an effort to get him to see reason. And that intervention was successful. So I think that uh, for the people that retain me, they're thinking things are not going well. And it can be actually quite serious. For example, what if the group doesn't believe in modern medicine and they're influencing the person not to take medication? That can be life-threatening. And I've been involved in interventions where an individual had diabetes and they were being told, you don't have to take your insulin. We have Jesus. a way of resolving that. And uh, one man that I worked with who was involved in a meditation group that claimed that they could cure his diabetes, uh, he had been hospitalized and almost died a couple times as a result of his involvement in the group. So if a family, a spouse, adult children feel that their loved one if their life is threatened, they feel that uh, things are getting to a point where things uh, they're going so badly that it's going to have a very adverse effects on, on this person's life, their education, their career, their marriage. Uh, the family may bring you in. Uh, but of course, many, many people, as you've said, walk away and decide on their own, look, I'm done. I'm finished with this group. and. The only, the only thing I would want to add to that is that when someone does leave a controlling group, that they should try to unpack their experience, that they should do some reading about how these groups operate, uh, what their dynamics are like, and in an effort to really kind of unpack their recruitment process, their indoctrination process, so that um, they don't have any residual effects. Hmm. So I'm glad you brought up the idea of residual effects. So, you know, I, I, I look back at Landmark and I can tell you some good things came out of it, uh, but I was also hyper aware of the reputation that Landmark had for turning people into Landmark junkies. So I went in very clear that I was going to do these two courses and they would never see me again. Uh, and 
so what I wonder, you know, I don't think that, you know, at the end of this podcast, people are going to say, okay, great. I listened to Rick. I'm going to stop reading self-help books and never go to any self-help seminars because Rick says, you know, a lot of them have characteristics of cults. So how do you maintain getting the benefits of these efforts without getting sucked into, you know, the downsides? Well, I just think there are so many alternatives. For example, let's say that you are experiencing severe problems in your marriage or in your personal life. There are licensed counselors that can help you. There are marriage and and family therapists. There are people that are really credible that could be helping you. There are support groups for people that are grieving uh, or people that have a drug or alcohol problem. So there are viable alternatives. And in, and in regards to continuing education, you, you can take night classes. You can, you can uh, go attend various seminars that are accredited, that can uh, provide credit towards a degree or can enhance your, your performance on the job that are recognized, that have, that have much more credibility than these self-help gurus. Or, or even you can talk to a friend, uh, a family member that you trust and say, look, this is what's bothering me. This is what's eating me up. And I, ne- I know you. I trust you. You know me. Let's talk about it. I wonder if you could help me. I respect you and I respect your judgment. So I think that people frequently forget all the alternatives that they have to these these seminars. And I think that there is an appeal, though, that there's some kind of magic bullet, that there's a a magical solution to our problems, that we can resolve them in a seminar, in a weekend, in in a long intensive uh, for a week or two. Uh, But in reality, it may take much more effort than that, much more work than that. And there are much more credible, viable means of doing it. And I think people should consider that. Yeah. So I guess the question then is, you know, even with that in mind, Landmark is still in business, as you mentioned, with hundreds of seminars around the world. Tony Robbins is thriving. I mean, self-improvement is definitely still very prevalent in our lives. I mean, I'm guessing this industry generates billions of dollars every year between books. I mean, hell, I mean, even, you know, the guests that I've had on our show, many of them would be probably categorized into the self-improvement category. My own books would fall into that category as much as I hate to admit that. Uh, So what I wonder, you mentioned earlier that we don't have actual research to show the effectiveness of a lot of this stuff, only outlier examples. Uh, How do we get to a point where there is regulation that actually is put in place to keep somebody like Tony Robbins from becoming somebody like Keith Ranieri? Well, there have been calls for regulation of this self-help industry over and over again, particularly after there are tragedies. I mean, Ranieri is one example. Uh, James Arthur Ray is another. I mean, people are literally dead because of self-help seminars that went wrong. Uh, There was a, a young woman who walked out of one of Ranieri's seminars and killed herself because she said in her suicide note that her brain had been destroyed. Her name was Kristen Snyder. She was uh, in her 30s. She had a master's degree. She had her whole life ahead of her. And, of course, the people that died under the direction of, of James Arthur Ray, they also were young, and they had their whole lives ahead of them. They left many grieving family members. So I think that there have been many calls for regulation of this industry. I don't know how that could uh, happen if the industry would begin to codify certain things and 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 collect a kind of uh, uh, a mandate for ethical standards and safety standards, et cetera, in these seminars. I think it could be done. I, th- I think it it really must be done in order to ensure people's safety but I don't know when it will be done. So let's say that we have a listener who happens to be a life coach who has clients. uh, And we had a life coach here, uh, my friend Kate Swoboda, who actually said, you know, I understand your criticism of life coaches. And she actually agreed with some of it. One of the things she said is that often you have unqualified people dealing with really, really serious issues like, you know, sexual trauma or, you know, things that only, you know, licensed counselors should be dealing with. 
Uh, yet I can tell you, I have a lot of friends who've worked with coaches. I have friends who are coaches who have had really positive impacts on their clients' lives. So from both sides, from the client side, as well as the person who serves a client, what is it that you would want them to know? I mean, particularly for the people who do this work, um, you know, how do they do that in a way that is ethical, that doesn't take advantage of their clients, um, and, and also serves them well, uh, without having their client invest tens of thousands of dollars they don't have. I mean, I've seen this over and over to the point where, you know, we did a, a weekend workshop and I was incredibly intentional about the fact that we would sell nothing at the end of the seminar. And I remember getting on stage, you mentioned euphoria. I told people, everyone here probably feels this incredible high right now, right? I said, I should tell you right now, that's going to be gone the moment you get on an airplane um, because we've created an environment that was designed to do that. Nobody tells people that. Um, so what would you say to people on both sides of this, this equation? I would say due diligence is the answer. You need to research and drill down into the background and the history of any group or seminar leader or life coach that you would uh, put yourself in their hands. Uh, do you know uh, the history of this particular seminar organization? Do, have they been sued for personal injury? Have they settled cases out of court? Have they a history of controversy in the press, in the media, uh, a pattern of complaints that have been identified? Uh, we have the ability to do this kind of research because, of course, we can just do a search online and find the information. And it's there. That is why in 1996, I launched the Cult Education Institute database, which is huge and has a, a, a great deal of information about Landmark Education and other groups. Uh, by the way, Werner Erhard, Landmark Education, sued me for a million dollars. Uh, they said that I was uh, uh, disparaging their product. I, I was guilty of defamation. And I found out in the process that they would do this periodically to intimidate people and get them to take information down or write apologies or whatever. I refuse to do it. And the information is, has, is not only still there, it's been added to. So people can find it and understand that Landmark has a troubled history. Uh, and by the way, the lawsuit was dismissed by Landmark. When they realized that I had a pro bono lawyer uh, from a large law firm representing me and that they could not beat me down through legal fees that, and that they would have to respond to discovery and that the things that were discovered could be shared publicly uh, through that litigation, they decided to cut and shut it down. And so I have not been sued again by Landmark. But I think people should take, make full use of, of the internet and, and research whoever they're going to put themselves in a, in a position of vulnerability with. If you're going to go to a seminar and be in that environment, you need to understand the full history of that group if there are any problems. And by the way, if anyone asks you to sign some of your rights away, in a yeah. release before you attend the seminar, that is a huge red flag. Because if you if you go to see a psychologist, a marriage and family therapist, or you go to a retreat for a church or a temple or uh, or whatever, uh, they would not ask you to sign a release uh, like Landmark does in which you waive your right to a trial by jury and instead are bound to binding arbitration. Wow, which is I don't poison, even remember signing that. <laughs> yeah, which is a poison pill if you would ever have an injury and try to get a lawyer on contingency. No lawyer would take your case. They would say, well, you've already signed away your trial by jury, right? You're, you're stuck with binding arbitration and uh, I'm not going to take the case. And so if, if anyone approaches you about a seminar and they want you to sign some kind of release in which you uh, release them in some way or diminish their exposure and their liability, that's a, a big warning to you that this is not a good thing to get involved with. Because what they're really saying to you is, look, we've, we've hurt people. That's why we have this uh, release. 
because we've been in situations where we've had to pay large settlements for personal injury or or we've lost in court. And now we want to indemnify ourselves by having you sign some of your rights away. Uh, you, you don't want to do that. And when you have a licensed therapist or a licensed counselor, they're accountable to that licensing board in that state. So that gives you a layer of accountability that gives you safety. And, and you need to think about that. And, and educational institutions that are accredited, they also have accountability. So you know, I think that there are, are other avenues of self-improvement that are safer and that, quite frankly, provide better results if you hang in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think to your point, everybody wants a, a silver bullet or a shortcut. I mean, that's why you see book titles like six figures in six months. And, you know, it doesn't take any of the, the context of, uh, you know, that person's background into account when they're, they're sharing this message. Uh, so one thing I know from having read the book is that you've also had deprogramming efforts that have failed, right? Yes. What happens there? Well, typically the person will uh, leave the intervention within the first day or so. And they'll just basically say to the family, I don't care that you're worried about me and everything. You have nothing to worry about. I'm fine. And I don't appreciate you springing this intervention on me because interventions are uh, typically a surprise. Uh, You don't give a person advance notice because they might go back to the group and say, well, what do I do? And the group will say, well, definitely walk away from that. Don't participate in that because they don't want to lose a member who's uh, supporting the organization. So typically the person will leave in the first day or so. And and no matter how much the family pleads with them or their spouse or their children saying, please stay, please uh, hear us out. We have concerns. They just decide to walk out. And uh, of course, the family cannot keep them from doing that. Uh, they can they can beg them, they can uh, entreat them, but they cannot uh, stop them. So yeah. once they leave, that's the end. So you know, there's a, a quote that I've, I've you know quoted multiple times here on the show, and it was from Warner Earhart. He was uh, Dan Kennedy, the copywriter, was sitting next to him at a barber shop, and he said, "Sum up, est for me in one sentence." And he said, "We sell independence, but we breed dependence." That is unsettling. I yeah. mean, we, we sell independence, but we breed dependence. And so, you know, and, and, and what I would want Werner Erhard to talk about is when, when did he go wrong? What mistakes did he make? I mean, this is a man who was, you know, he was, I think he was a salesman. That was his background. I mean, he wasn't known as a great thinker or, or a great philosopher. He copied what he taught through his seminars from other sources. Uh, along the way, he made many mistakes in life. He made many mistakes after his epiphany that, uh, you know, that he would have this philosophy that would animate his life and that would become his, his crusade, you know, with his seminars. I would be interested to, for Werner Erhard to address what mistakes has he made as a father, uh, as a seminar leader? What mistakes did he make in developing the curriculum? Does he acknowledge that he's made mistakes? I mean, because a lot of people felt that they were hurt by Landmark or by Est. So, and and his his divorces, his children, the problems he's had with his family, what self-examination has he gone through and learned from that he could share? Mm. Uh, Because I find so often that these self-help gurus are incapable of of the kind of self-examination that they expect all of us to go through while we're being subjected to their seminar training. I mean, they want us to confess. They want us to uh, open up and admit our mistakes, our vulnerabilities as part of the catharsis that will ultimately save us or, or deliver us to a better level of, of, of understanding and performance. But what, when do they open up and acknowledge their mistakes and, and what they got wrong along the way 
developing their seminar training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I want to finish with talking specifically about the podcast, uh, because we bring a lot of people here who probably fall into the personal development category, um, whether they're teaching us, you know, through the lens of psychology, through the lens of their life story, they all have really inspiring stories. And I want to read something to you that I have written as part of my upcoming book. You know, I said the people that I've interviewed on Unmistakable Creative have given me an education that's kicked the crap out of the one I got in school. But the most valuable things they've taught me are to question the validity of what I learned from them in the context of my own life, never follow their advice to the letter, treat their advice as guidance instead of gospel, and draw my own conclusions. So that's what I've taken away from a thousand interviews, but I'm the one who gets to do the interview. What do you think our listeners should be listening for when they're listening to our podcast guests? And, you know, making sure they don't find themselves falling down a rabbit hole that leads them nowhere. Because I don't want my listeners to end up with bad life outcomes. Like, I would never want that on my conscience. Well, I think that they they should be hearing, uh, uh, you know, a kind of three-dimensional, nuanced uh, kind of presentation in which that person acknowledges that it doesn't work all the time, that it that it's a process uh, in, in that that they're learning themselves, that they've made mistakes, uh, that they don't have an answer for everything, uh, that no one does, and that um, that progress takes hard work. There's no instant solution, uh, and and just that kind of reality based uh, discussion, and also whether or not uh, this particular process of of coaching or or development actually produces results and how yeah. can those results be measured and what study would would they point to to say look this is the proof of our method our methodology works and this is the proof of it and we've done a a study to to prove it and I would like to see studies like that undertaken and then published in peer-reviewed journals where people can honestly say, hey, they've demonstrated the efficacy of their training in a way that is really solid, and, and they must believe in it to put themselves through this process of research and, and demonstrating the, the proof of their training or mm. coaching. Yeah. So I think that the, there's two final questions I have. You know, people create a lot of aspirational media. Uh, what do you think is the responsibility of people who create aspirational media uh, in this process? Well, truth in advertising. I mean, again, how how did they develop uh, their their system? How did they develop their training? Uh, what mistakes did they make along the way, and how can they prove to the skeptic that uh, the the goals have actually been realized? I mean, uh, th these groups will say, "Okay, well, this is what we're this is the 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 goal of our training is to make you a, a, a fully empowered, realized, authentic human being." What does that mean? Uh, what research do they have to help us to understand the pro the progress that people really make? How can yeah. they measure it? it? It's funny you say that. We had a, a course called the Loyal Audience Mastermind, and you know, in the FAQ, you know, one of the questions I put was, "Can you guarantee that I will you know be able to grow an audience?" And I actually said, "No." Uh, I said, "The last guy who guaranteed something was Rick Singer," and we looked, we saw how that turned out. He's in jail now, so no, we can't guarantee that. Um, what we can do is we can provide you with the information that has helped us to do it. Yeah. Setting real goals and being honest about the, the possibilities, the outcomes that could occur and not, and, and not acting like uh, you have all the answers. I, I don't know how many times in multi-level marketing, for example, that uh, they basically hold out this image that you're going to get rich quick. And then when people don't get rich quick, which is the overwhelming majority of any any participants in an, an MLM multi-level marketing scheme, uh, they're told, "Well, that's your fault. It's it's you. You're you're just a fool. You're you're uncoachable. We can't work with you because our plan is perfect." 
And quite frankly, no plan is perfect. And so if they're not willing to acknowledge that and acknowledge that our plan just just doesn't work for everyone, but we have these tools and we have uh, th- these ideas and you can see how they'll work for you, but we can't guarantee anything. And yeah. very few multi-level marketing schemes or personal growth seminars will admit that. Mm. Wow. Well, um, I feel like I could talk to you for three hours about this stuff. Uh, you've, you're just a, a wealth of knowledge about all of this. So uh, first off, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your wisdom and your insights with listeners. Uh, I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at The Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I would say that 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 would be their their integrity their honesty their transparency uh that their willingness to explain themselves and what they're doing mm. Amazing. Um, well, Rick, I can't thank you enough, as I said, for taking the time to join us uh, and share your, your wisdom and your insights with our, you know, our listeners. Uh, where can people find out more about you, your books, your work, and everything else that you're up to in the world? Well, my book is Cults Inside Out. It's available th- through Amazon and Kindle. It can be downloaded or bought through Amazon. And they can find me on Twitter, Rick Allen Ross. They can find the Cult Education Institute. Facebook page, or they can go to culteducation.com, where they will find a database that's been under construction since 1996 with information about everything that we've been talking about. And it's free to the public and nothing but a click away, really. Mm, Amazing. Well, uh, like I said, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and for everyone listening. We'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. Look, staying healthy isn't easy. Watching your diet, hitting the gym, avoiding stress. But a good night's rest helps boost your overall health and wellness. And it couldn't be easier. The new Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed is the only bed that effortlessly adjusts and responds to both of you. The result? You wake up ready for anything. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Don't miss our weekend special. Save up to $1,000 on the Sleep Number 360 i10 Smart Bed and adjustable base. Ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com.